Good morning, everyone. It's great to see those of you here in the sanctuary, and it's great to wave at those of you on Zoom. Everybody turn around and wave at Zoom. Welcome to Heritage Universalist Unitarian Church, where, as we often say, the Universalist comes first. My name is Bill Gupton. I serve as the senior minister here alongside our director of Lifespan Faith Development, Lacey Adams. And we're delighted to welcome you to Heritage today, whether you are here with us in person or watching on Zoom, and whether you've been coming for years or whether you're a relatively new visitor. If the latter is true for you, we invite you to sign our guest book in the lobby and to speak with our president, Julie Kane, our board president, there she is, um, and after the service to get a tour of our facility and to answer any questions you may have. At this time, I ask you to either turn off your phones or to put them in airplane mode so we can avoid any awkward interruptions of our time of celebration together and also to prevent any interference with our technology here in the sanctuary or with our Zoom transmission. Following the service, everyone is invited to gather in our great hall out, in the, out the sanctuary doors and to the right for refreshments and conversation. And if you're on Zoom, you'll be invited to gather in a, in a conversation room. I hope as you entered the sanctuary this morning, you got a sheet of paper that includes today's order of service on one side and announcements of congregational activities and events of interest on the other side. Take a moment to read through those announcements and do let us know if there is anything there that piques your interest or if you have any questions. Uh, one thing that I believe did not make it that I want to uh, lift up for you this morning, uh, two weeks from today on Sunday, October 30th, uh, we will be having a community fair after the ch service in the Great Hall. Uh, this will be an opportunity for you to learn about activities and ways to get involved here at Heritage Church. And if you are one of those persons who uh, oversees an activity or ways for people to get involved at Heritage Church. Uh, two weeks from today, we're going to invite you to set up tables out there and to meet with folks and to talk about uh, the, the aspects of congregational life that you uh, would like to uh, invite other people to participate in with you. So our community fair two weeks from today after service on October 30th. I alluded a moment ago to the fact that here at Heritage we honor our Universalist roots, which go back to our founding as the first Universalist Church of Cincinnati in 1827. This morning we welcome a guest preacher who will offer us a unique perspective on the radical theological idea that is called Universalism. I will tell you more about Lee Waltz later, but for now let's just welcome Lee to Heritage. Our call to worship this morning is adapted from uh, the words of my colleague, Reverend Rain, Wayne Arneson. From seemingly separate lives and different paths we have come. From distinct joys and profound sorrows we have come. With unique insights and personal convictions we have come. We have come and we are here, here in this space here on this screen, here connected to one another in mystery and wonder. We've come to make a common life, to acknowledge our common life at these many intersections, these many connecting paths, and to expand our joys, share our sorrows, deepen our insights, and proclaim our convictions. We are here and we have come to weave the threads of our lives more strongly into the whole cloth that is religious community. Come, let us worship and celebrate together.
Wherever you are right now, I invite you to rise in body or spirit as we sing our hymn of invocation and repeat our congregational covenant. The words to both, through the magic of technology and the skill of our tech coordinator, Kevin Palmer, will appear right before your eyes. Let's begin with Spirit of Life. By this covenant, we affirm that love is the spirit of this church, and the quest for truth is its sacrament, and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, to serve humankind in fellowship, to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with the divine. Thus do we covenant with each other. Good morning, all. Good morning. I know that later in the service, you all will have a time of meditation and reflection, but I'm going to ask you to actually take a few moments of silence now so that you might hear your breath and, if you can, feel your heart. This heart is a, an important thing we're going to talk a bit about this morning. So really try to feel your heart beating. Good job. That's exactly what we're doing. Social science research tells us, research, science research, okay, tells us that the human heartbeat will sink to the heartbeats of those around it when participating in common ritual. Think about that. Your heartbeat that's in your body that has its own rate and speed and pulse, all your own, when you are in community doing ritual together, that heart will reach out to the heart next to it and find a common rhythm. So if you were on pilgrimage to the Hajj, think about the massive movement of human bodies that is the Muslim's pilgrimage to the Hajj, that those heartbeats might beat together as one. Or if you come to the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem to pray, your heart will sink with the others praying near you. So it is with any deep ritual that our soul, our heart, our body, hopes to connect to the body next to it. It's miraculous when you really think about it, that something that is in you, that is yours, that enlivens your life, might reach out to the heart of another. So it is too in indigenous communities, where it's said that the drum is the heartbeat of a community. We know that that's not just a euphemism. It's not a metaphor. It's true that when we are in drumming together, our hearts sync up with each other and with the drum. So it is that in our lives, that we all, our bodies, on a very basic level, hopes, dreams, desires, to beat together with a person next to you, to create some community, to create a connection. This piece of information, the study that I heard about, sort of uh, amazed me to think about 
the interconnections that we have that we don't even know about, that we can't even know about, that we might never be aware of, but that, that are already there. Think about all the other kinds of tiny connections we might have. In this very room, what kind of connection might you have with another person? Someone might share your favorite food or your favorite color. It might seem superficial, but there are tons of tiny ways in which we connect with each other. And those tiny connections, when we find out about them, when we see them, when we explore them, start to make bigger connections in the world. So today, as we go through worship, be engaged in finding connections, in making connections, in connecting yourself to what you're hearing, and to finding connections with those next to you. As, as, we, uh, as our young people will be doing today, we're going to be finding connections with our indigenous heritages and knowledges that we might otherwise be lost. And you all will be on your own journey. But in all of these journeys, let us seek to find a connection with someone or something new. <clears throat> Let's sing Lacey and the children off to their religious education activities this morning by joining voices in the first two verses of hymn number 301, Touch the Earth, Reach the Sky. take those words to heart as well. <clears throat> so I've set aside a couple of minutes this morning to speak about a situation, a dire situation, an emergency that we are facing. And I'm not talking here about our church. I'm talking about our country. I'm talking about our democracy about something some of us, not all of us, and we must remember that, but some of us have taken for granted for generations. The idea that we have a voice, a say in determining the direction of our society. The fifth principle of Unitarian Universalism speaks of the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process within our congregations, that's here at Heritage Church, and in society at large. That's in our cities, our townships, our states, our nation. Now you're probably aware that there's an important election coming up. But I wonder if you were aware, and I'm sure some of you are, and have thought about the fact that there are nearly 300 election deniers on ballots for statewide offices all over this country and God knows how many for county and local offices. Those people are on the ballot right now because the election has begun. Early voting is underway in Ohio and Indiana and it soon will be in Kentucky too. Think about that. Some folks have already voted for people who do not believe in free and fair elections. People who have gone on record as saying that the last election was quote unquote stolen and whose sole purpose for running for office this time is to assure that candidates of their chosen party will always win, regardless of how many people vote for or against them. Because any election that my candidate doesn't win must have been rigged. That's what we live in right now. That's the ethos and that's the emergency. You saw the news this week. You have seen the news this year. 
You saw the news on January 6, 2021. So you know I, who am sometimes the master of hyperbole, am not using hyperbole here when I say that our democracy, our way of life, is hanging in the balance right now, and we don't know how it's going to go. There is much at stake in this election, and the contrasts are stark. So the answer to what can I do is very, very clear. Vote. Vote as if America depends on it, because America does depend on it. And with that, I turn it over to Aaron Walzewski, who will tell you about this week's outreach offering. Good morning. Before I talk about sharing our abundance, I want to tag on to what Reverend Bill just said and, and double down on the importance of voting. If you need help voting, registering to vote, figuring out where your polling place is, figuring out what happened to my ballot if it didn't come here, I volunteer a lot of time on the side for a national nonpartisan voting hotline called 866-OUR-VOTE. That's 866-O-U-R-V-O-T-E. It's across the entire country. It is nonpartisan, and it is staffed with hundreds of people trained by me who will answer your call and help you find anything you need. So whether that's early voting, access to ballot, anything that you need between now and Election Day or following Election Day, if you have a ballot, a provisional ballot or need to cure a ballot, please consider calling the, the hotline 866-OUR-VOTE to make sure that you, all of your neighbors, all of your friends get the access to the ballot that you need. But today I'm here to talk about sharing our abundance. Uh, once a month we support the inner parish ministry for our sharing our abundance when we donate our time and talents and money to support people in our community who need that. So we do this once a month, but this month is actually a little bit of more of a connection, going back to what Lacey was talking about with finding those connections, because we've talked before about uh, some unfortunate things happening in Forest Hills School District. And now's the part where I say, and now for some good news. Forest Hills School District just ended their five-day food drive for inner parish ministry. So our, our kids have been talking a lot about it. They were encouraged to wear green on Friday, so I'm wearing my green today. And they've been collecting cans and non-perishable food in the school district for the past five days to support an organization that this church has supported every month uh, for many, many years. So you know I like to have you turn to your neighbor for a quick second, and I'm going to do that right now. So double down on Lacey's, find connections with other people. Whether it's a food drive that you participated in as a kid or that your kids participated in or some connection that you know or feel to inner parish ministry, please find somebody near you that did not come to church with you today. Introduce yourself and talk about either food drives or your connection to food drives or to your, your connection to inner parish ministry for about 30 seconds.
Thank you. These offerings are gratefully received. Thanks, Aaron. And, and I s assume people have kind of noticed that Aaron is now uh, taking over our outreach offerings uh, after Regina Pugh has moved to Arizona. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I figured I needed to say that because even though that news is a few months old, people, not everyone knows. Regina and her husband, Mike, uh, moved to Arizona this summer, and we, we miss her greatly. Uh, so she has uh, she started and oversaw our outreach offering for years. And now Aaron is very capably filling those shoes. Uh, and if you want to reach out to Regina, she's got a new email address. It's in the church directory online. Um, so people come, people go. We, we meet new people. Today we meet someone new. Uh, our guest speaker this morning brings an eclectic background and an amazing life to this pulpit. I'm happy to welcome Unitarian Universalist Seminarian and Ministerial Aspirant Lee Waltz to Heritage. Lee is a theologian and philosopher, an artist and a filmmaker, a world wanderer and a universe ponderer. He's from Dayton and now lives in Tip City, Ohio, but at the age of 18, he began a lifetime of journeying and religious exploration living in Malaysia with first a Muslim family and then a Catholic family. He says that in one year, and remember this is when he was 18, he attended a Catholic school, a Muslim funeral, Sikh services, Taoist services, Catholic masses, and visited a Buddhist shrine, a Hindu shrine, and well, the list goes on. Um, he, was, he has worked on a farm in Germany, attended the University of Vienna, received a degree in cinema studies from Los Angeles, worked in the movie business, served in the Navy, taught art, drawing, and photography, and has written two screenplays, just to name a few things. Lee describes himself as an artist, a writer, a seeker, and a mystic. Please welcome to our pulpit, Lee Waltz. Good morning. My thanks to Reverend Gupt and, and Reverend Kelly. Um, and to you, an open-hearted congregation. But I'm Lee Waltz, and I'm grateful to be able to speak here. Let us thank God for the shared experience of truth. Let us be silent in that thought for just a few moments. As Reverend Gupton said, I consider myself a universalist. Today, I'd like to tell you what I mean by that and the opinions may surprise you. Interestingly, in my opinion, none of what I'm going to say is very new. I came to universalism via thinking and rethinking, not Christianity. I used ideas, bad and good, and circumstances, bad and good. When an idea did not apply, it was less useful than one that did. When we come upon exceptions to some rule we've made, we learn and modify our worldview. The most useful tools become shiny and well-worn. Philosophical universalism is that way. And it has a lot to do with the foundation of science. And it didn't happen in Europe. That is small u universalism. Here we are in a church, a universalist church. In the religious context, universalism is capitalized, the U is capitalized, and is, or at least historically was, understood to be about the idea of all people being saved or redeemed through Christ, as opposed to other Christian denominations that somehow cling to the idea of some souls being cast into hell for eternity. And that is othering within a religion, and so it is becoming passé, or at least I hope it's becoming passé. Since the Bible tries to have it both ways, loving, kindness, and eternal damnation, like the Quran, uh, the relevance is somehow eroded. At least for me, contradictions are not often useful tools. 
as a kid, when I saw that the people who abused the Native Americans saw themselves as Christians, I ran away. Literally and figuratively, I ran away. I did everything I could to be somewhere else. I went to Borneo for a year. Once back home, my uncle asked, well, do you think all people are basically the same? And when I said yes, he said, good, then I don't think your year was wasted. In the, in the Kata Upanishad, it says, what is here is also there, and what is there is also here. And that, that wisdom from the Upanishads, that, that's, Upanishads are documents that are about us and our relationship to the universe. They're about 24 centuries old, 20, 2,400 years old. They relate and they have useful ideas. I say that's about salvation, but not in the simple hooray for Jesus sense. It is more philosophical universalism than Christian universalism. I think modern church universalism is now more small u universalism than capital U universalism. It's because we can see more now. It's also because we're giving up on othering, or at least trying to. Christian universalism is how we got here, but philosophical universalism is how we'll stay here, or at least I hope that's true. It's hooray for Christ consciousness or hooray for consciousness at all. And here's a story. Folks were leaning against a fence near our UU fellowship in Yellow Springs, praying apparently, and, and one of them looked up as my friend approached and they smiled at him and he, and he asked what they were doing. And they said, we're praying for the people at that church because they allow so much error. And so my friend joined them for a while. And he never told them he was a member of that fellowship that they were praying for. Uh, remaining silent can be an act of love. Thoughtful silence is a form of connection. We seem to sense that unbounded love implies the existence of God. For the people not believing in God, we hope that they can believe in charity or love. And those things are probably the same. Most people who sample love want more. A poet of old, his name was Rumi, said, all longing, all appetites are disguised appetites for God. All is a universalist word. The folk singer Woody Guthrie, near the end of his life, told the admitting nurse at the hospital when she asked his religious preference for the paperwork. And he said, you can write all or none. I had not heard that story when I was in the Navy and wanted perennial philosophy listed on my dog tags. <laughs> the guy making them said, what's perennial philosophy? And I said, it's what all religions have in common. Woody Guthrie was dying. And dog tags are a meditation on mortality. The mystery straddling death and birth is what religion is about. Aging, we become more universal. For example, discovering compassion as the Grinch did, or as Ebenezer Scrooge did. Those are peak experiences. Also, watching goofy children become handsome, elegant, responsible adults. If we discern and appreciate that the latent, hidden beauty must be omnipresent, that is awesome and universal. An artist, Andy Warhol, said, either everyone is a beauty or no one is a beauty. The highest aesthetic experience is a spiritual experience, am I right? Transformation is happening all around us and inside us right now. It goes in a direction. We grow from illusion toward truth. I think everybody's united in that quest. I have experienced what we might call worship in many different cultures, always participating more deeply. I relish being in worship and have seen others this way. Why would the purposes of God be limited to any one nation or culture? I say the promises to Abraham are extended to all. All is a universalist word. 
For sailors, pilots are the ones who get ships safely into and out of port. Sailors call chaplains sky pilots because they help you get to heaven. They attend to each person with care for their individual faith. The chaplain has to help. I think we're all called to help in an accommodating way. A religion on a dog tag doesn't matter so much to God. That has to be true for to love our enemies. We're all on one road just passing through. People progress toward love and a perfection beyond body wearing and time. I call that salvation. Interconnectedness, visible and implied, is sacred for a universalist. Since we now can access more information than Erasmus could in his lifetime, our spiritual work becomes integration and relation. We have unity if we can claim it. Seeing the agreement guarantees appreciation of big U universalism. Simon Davies, ex, his evolutionary tree of world religions lays out our interconnectedness in one image. It goes back more than 50,000 years. It's the big tree as a big picture. It's a new model. Simon Davies, evolutionary tree of world religions, check it out. The biggest comprehensive view is a name for God, the one. As you continue to ponder uh, this intricate and interconnected diagram of the evolutionary tree of world religions, and perhaps make a note to self to Google Simon Davies later, Please rise as you're willing and able. Stretch your bodies as you've been stretching your minds and prepare to sing our next hymn, number 187. It sounds along the ages. Now we're not super familiar with this hymn, so a couple of suggestions. You might actually want your hymnal on this because you might not know the tune, number 187. Uh, and also Les is gonna play it through for us once so we can hear it and then we'll sing the words we'll now again, magically appear before you if you don't have your hymnal.
The Sanskrit word for world also means the cyclicality of all matter, life, and existence. The French philosopher Voltaire said, all of nature is recycling. Seeing that, we participate and begin to transcend. In his letter to the Corinthians, Paul says, all will be made alive in Christ. And I agree, but understand Christ as the resulting consciousness in a soul that participates in Godhead. Let's try to grasp what the master meant when he'd say, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do. In fact, will do greater works than these. And that's John 14, verse 12. The most, the Gospel of John, by the way, is what I consider the most dharmic, the most universal. Uh, the me believed in here in this passage is the consciousness of the universe. It is the one who has seen sovereign love realized and walks in the essence of God within and God omnipresent. Our interconnectedness is becoming more and more apparent. The earth is more than a bowl of commodities and it needs our help. Shackled to the earth, we used to say primitive religions worship nature and we used to look down on them for that. And now we realize materially there isn't much else. <laughs> there is no planet B. Uh, there's a scene in the film, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? where the three escaped convicts have a tussle about who's gonna make the decisions. Pete nominates himself, but so does Everett. And they look to Delmar for the deciding vote, and he says, well, I'm with you fellers. <laughs> and they're all shackled together anyway. It's good for a laugh, but we're in, we are in a situation of enforced unity being on Earth. We are in a situation of enforced unity being on the material plane. We find interconnectedness and attempt to live in that truth. Many share the notion that God loves us, and if a person tries to reciprocate, amazing things can happen. It's a daring experiment, by the way. I have experienced this. In addition to the wondrous transformation from alcoholic wretch to a productive citizen, collecting what people call miracles, my reality incorporated sacred geometry as I was learning about it in a most beautiful dream. It was night in a city and we were in a poorly lit part of town. My friend said we had to get off the street to avoid some danger and he wanted me to follow him urgently to the door of a nearby house. But I was looking at the stars in the sky, how beautiful they were and I could see faint lines connecting the stars and the lines began forming the pattern of the Merkaba or Sri Yantra or Metatron's cube, or the flower of life, or Simon Davies' evolutionary tree of world religions. Uh, they're all the same thing. Uh, it was becoming clearer and clearer. It was dazzling, and I wanted my friend to look up, but he pulled me into the house. The dream continued and involved more beauty, and a trans person guided us to safety. But I heard my material plane phone ringing, and I answered it. On the other end, a person asked, are you awake? And I said, yes, I'm awake. There are seeming exceptions to perceiving God's love, and there can be noise in the signal, but consistently when a person cultivates a relationship with God or enters into truth-seeking, their lives are transformed for the better, and mystics agree. I ask non-theist and skeptic friends to allow that virtue limits suffering. I love that sentence, virtue limits suffering. I want the bumper sticker. I want to be able to give you the bumper sticker. Uh, cultivating love is a virtue. It is cultivating high ideals. When universalism was young, the so-called non-dissenting denominations wondered what could assure morality among Christians if not the threat of hell. Uh, and I have an answer. If we act according to our highest ideals, we will see the hand of God more often in our lives. If we don't believe in God, but still cultivate the discipline of acting according to our highest ideals, we will limit suffering for ourselves and for others. 
If we trust that, we have that in common with sages. The highest morality is the same thing as the highest spirituality. What culture doesn't have some form of the golden rule? Yet if I know this from the Bible and the Dhammapada and the Upanishads and the Hadith, but cannot live into this universal teaching at all, if I can't walk the talk, I am, as they say, a donkey with a library on its back. Perhaps we could agree that the world is a functioning, comprehensive system with all its religions. Who am I to critique the components? We're starting to see the dangers of monoculture. If I remove a component of a system, the system is likely to function worse, not better. I have been the atheist arguing against the existence of God. I have been the agnostic not knowing to hesitate or to leap into faith or to work for a mystic experience. I have become the one who can stay awake all night arguing for the existence of God. Now I see that anyone who holds these views is as I was and as I am. What is there is also here and what is here is also there from the Kata Upanishad. And this vision across development, this seeing in knowing of thou art that, this is universalizing. It's love. The rabbinical student asked the rabbi whether the repeated God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob were the same God. The rabbi said that it emphasizes the individual personal relationship with the one God. The God of Abraham, the God of Tiffany, the God of Leslie. If we don't cultivate that relationship, or any relationship. Compassion becomes harder. The random person loves their own, but that's about it. Each carries that of God within, so our challenge becomes widening our circles of compassion and seeing our interconnectedness. So before we sing our next hymn, just take a moment and contemplate the beautiful example of sacred geometry that you see before you that uh, Lee's been talking about. Uh, Lee actually gifted me with um, a, either this or one just like it uh, earlier this morning, um, and it is now a, one of my prized uh, objects, sacred objects in my office. Um, so the interconnections that he's talking about and the weaving and, and, the, and, and the different strands that take anyone out and it's not the same, each is an important part of the whole. Uh, given this idea, let us now sing together. Rise once more in body or spirit, wherever you are, whenever you are, and sing together one that you probably don't need to pull the hymnal out for, number 323, Break not the circle.
I believe universalists regard the interconnectedness of everything as a call to accept the challenge of loving the other. One another is a challenge, but the other is the current challenge. The message of the prodigal son story to me is that all can be brought home. That's Luke 15. And when I sit and contemplate the many biblical passages that support the theory of a universally loving God, I usually shed tears. They're a strange kind of tears of joy because in spite of all the stuff I know about me, God loves me and I can tell. In spite of what little I may know about some other person, God loves them and I can tell. I am living proof that God's love can be experienced as a process of redemption in one lifetime. If we notice that all people, all creatures, are really doing the best they can with the cards they were dealt, that makes them and us more forgivable. Not everyone was carefully taught. That's a reference to a great song from an old movie, South Pacific, that James Taylor recently re-recorded. In the released version of the film, they cut it out. If we could understand everything, we might forgive everything. Not everyone knows we are always teaching and being taught. Our minds have to get quiet enough to discover our inner guide. A great soul said, there is a higher court than the courts of justice. It's the court of conscience. It supersedes all other courts. Another great soul said, abandon any action that pricks your conscience. Another great soul said, we become what we think. When the mind is pure, joy follows. Well then, to purify the mind, quiet the mind. I'm here saying it because it is what I want to learn. It is what I need to learn. I want to be busy about it. Each of us contains the universe. We think there are only binary choices and that there are six directions. The compass points north, south, east, west, and up and down. And then we stumble onto within, the seventh direction. That's where the kingdom of heaven is. We are being transformed from one degree of glory to another in the image of the Lord. That's also from Corinthians. But it can also be seen as the cyclicality of all matter, life, and existence. If our model of reality leaves something out, it probably won't work universally for us. If our model disregards other findings, we weaken our model. The people running from religion, like I ran off to Borneo, can see the self-imposed limitations. They don't want that. I believe we don't want that. I know I push the bounds of my love and compassion slower than I would like to, and I fail many times to try to manifest my highest ideals. And we are challenged to understand larger existence. Seeing that so many of the rising generations dodge religion, we universalists, in my opinion, should rise to the challenge of accommodating those who will discover and rediscover the mystery. I want to conclude this morning by telling you a story, something of a spiritual and uh, universalist allegory. It was inspired by gathering peaches in my mother-in-law's back property. A flower bud on a branch of a tree moves in the breeze and the sun. As it opens, the flower awakens. It feels alone and unique, but after a time, it senses blossoms nearby. Opening further, it sees the other similar flowers on the same tree. They have discussions about what they are and what they represent. Some agree, some argue. Bees visit, and at first the flowers are frightened, but the bees reassure them they mean no harm. While the flowers are talking about the, what the bees really are in the big scheme of things, their petals start to shrink and blow off in the breeze. One of the flowers shouts, I'm becoming a peach. We're all becoming peaches. We have this branch, th these flowers inside us. We're all becoming peaches outside of time. 
Some flowers nod in the breeze in agreement. Another one says, she's bonkers. And some flowers agree, saying, I hope that doesn't happen to any of us. And they all blossomed and became ripe peaches and were eaten by happy children. And one child saved the hard seed from her peach and planted it in a cup she made at school. When it sprouted, she gave it as a gift to her grandmother. And in time, they enjoyed the pink blossoms and the delicious fruit that came from their tree. Amen. So Lee has certainly given us a lot to think about, and I also want to lift up something he said. If we don't quiet our mind, we can't hear the inner guide. So I invite us now to do just that, to quiet our mind, to become comfortable as we can, as we are able in body so that we can then allow our mind to quiet and to ponder and to wonder and to follow where it may go and may lead us in a time of silence and meditation. Namaste and Amen. And remember that you can always do that again. Just about anywhere, just about any time. Maybe not while you're driving, <laughs> but you can always do that again. Each week at Heritage, we engage in a beloved sacred ritual we call Candles of Community. In this precious and holy time, we bring our joys and our sorrows to this historic altar. Historic altar that I was honored and delighted to be able to show to Lee and tell him about this morning. It's here every week, and we might not think about it that much, but every now and then it's worth it. As we share from our hearts those memories and milestones of our lives, and we are engaged in co-creation with the divine, creating of sacred geometry, sacred circles of interconnection, weaving the fabric, the spiritual fabric that holds us together as a community. In a moment, if you have a joy or sorrow to share, I will invite those of you here in the sanctuary to come forward along either wall and take the microphone from Steph Please tell us your name and briefly share what is in your heart, and Steph will light a candle as each person speaks. If you're on Zoom, you may type your joy or sorrow into the chat. But first, uh, there are a few joys and sorrows that were sent in prior to the service via email and other methods, and I will share those uh, with you beginning now. Finally, uh, as always, we light one last candle to recognize the joys and the sorrows that are held in our hearts but remain unexpressed. And 
Thank you, Steph. These closing words are from Daniel Budd. As we go forth from this place, may our eyes be open to the beauty and abundance of life in which we live. May our ears be attuned to the still, small voice within, guiding and calling us on. And may our hearts ever reach out to touch and to be touched by the source and spirit of life itself. Blessed be, ashe, namaste, and amen. As you prepare for singing our closing hymn and saying our benediction, which I'm inviting you by that to rise in body or spirit, closing hymn is number 318, we would be one. As you prepare to sing and speak together, I just want to offer my gratitude and thanks to Lee for coming uh, down from Dayton, or from Tip City, actually, I guess, uh, today. Uh, to be with us. We loved having you. Thanks for coming. Number 318, we would be one. Join hands around the sanctuary. Lee, this is our closing tradition here at Heritage. It's a call and response benediction uh, with everyone connected. And as we connect with our tech people back in the back corner, we uh, allow that to virtually, symbolically, and as we know scientifically <laughs> through the great mystery, connect with those on Zoom as well. May the spirit of life, May the spirit of life that each of us possesses, that each of us possesses flow, from one to the other. flow from one to the other. May it stay with us and bring us peace and harmony until we meet again. Amen. Amen.